let's look to our proverb, the third proverb tonight. And uh, if it hadn't been for all the rabbit trails I run down when I'm preaching, I probably would have finished Proverbs 3 last Wednesday night, but I did go down. They're just too tempting. I have to chase those rabbits. Uh, so I did not finish, so we're going to try to come back and finish it tonight. But let's go to the Lord and ask His blessing. Gracious Father, we come before you tonight and we pray that you'll bless our time in your word, that you will come as, as the Holy Spirit and that you would be our teacher in our presence tonight. Lord, just let me kind of go to the side and, and you come be our teacher, Lord, because it's about you and we pray that we'll hear from you, that we'll learn from your word tonight. God, we ask, Lord, that you'll, you'll just help us, Lord, to to take in these, these wonderful words of wisdom that our Father has given to us, that we might grow by this wisdom, that we might serve you more faithfully and lovingly. And Lord, we, we, we ask this, we pray it in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so, so, so we're making our way through Proverbs. Uh, it's, a, it's a book of godly wisdom passed down from King Solomon to his son, and it's really, as much as, as it is that, it's, it's, it's really just as much a book of God's wisdom that our Heavenly Father has passed down to us so that we can benefit from His wisdom. Last week we began looking at Proverbs 3, and in Proverbs 3 there are seven wise and godly principles that we learn about. We, we really only got through the first three last time, but there are seven, and as you go through the chapter 7, godly wise principles that we want to look at and examine tonight and with each of these seven godly wise principles there are rewards attached to these principles there are promises of god's blessing just like uh, when the scripture says you know that the, the commandment to honor your father and mother is the first commandment with the commandment with promises all these wise godly principles if you live by them you are promised to be blessed you are promised God's blessings and His rewards upon you with each of these wise, godly principles. So they are worth understanding, they are worth knowing, and they are worth living by because they, you will be greatly rewarded if you live by these things. So the first thing we noticed last time, the first godly principle we see here that we looked at, and we, we kind of went over there, and I'm going to do a little quick review of the first three, and then we'll jump right into the fourth one and make our way down the rest of the list. But the first thing we noticed last time was remembering the reward of remembering what's right. That's number one. We, we find the reward. There's reward in remembering what's right. And in verse number one, that's, that's how Solomon starts. He says, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. And so that's the, that's the first one. Listen to what your Father's teaching you and remember it. You know, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Remember it. Don't forget it. Don't, don't let, it, let it get away from you. And, and like we said, uh, and like we just said, like we said with all three of these principles last time, there is a reward. If you live by this godly principle, you will be blessed. And here's what it says. He says, my son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For verse 2, here's the reward. For length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you. And, and, and think about those promises. Those are wonderful, wonderful promises. Length of days, long life, and peace, they will add to you. You know, ever since the time that Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, ever, time, ever since the time they rebelled, sin came into the world. And what happened? They were cast out of the garden. And ever since that time, we as people, men and women, we have been cursed by sin. We have been cursed by the curse of sin and death. And we've been robbed of the life that God originally intended for us. He intended for us to live with Him forever. And we've been robbed of that through our sin and through the curse of our sin that we chose. And we know the only way we can get that life back is through the cross, through the death and the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Yet Solomon's not just speaking here of eternal life in a spiritual sense. He's, he's talking about the life we 
live. He's talking about how we can also live a very long, very peaceful, physical life that's greatly blessed by God. He goes on here, verse 3, he says, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Mercy is the hesed, the, the everlasting uh, merciful kindness of God that He pours out on us each day. What we need is mercy, don't we? Because we're sinners and we are in need of that everlasting mercy. Uh, and, and, and then the word truth, it comes from emeth, the Hebrew word emeth, which is the everlasting faithfulness of God. If He says something, He's telling the truth. He will do it. You can count on what he says. He is faithful to keep his word. And when you, when you embrace the godly wisdom that, that our Father is trying to teach us here, you embrace that godly wisdom. You say, yes, I'll live by it. You remember it. You are inviting that chesed, everlasting mercy of God, into your life, that, that loving kindness of God. And you are inviting that emeth, that that everlasting faithfulness of God into your life. But if you turn your ears away from it, you forget that wisdom, then like Solomon says here, you are causing his mercy and truth to forsake you. He says, don't let that mercy and truth forsake you. And so you turn your, way, your ears away from that, you let it, you would do allow it to forsake you. So he says, don't forget them, but, but rather he says in verse, verse three, he says, bind them around your neck, like, like you'd wear a piece of clothing, you know, a scarf around your neck that you're not ashamed to wear. Bind them around your neck. Uh, wear it wear, in a place where it can be visible. And he says, write them upon the tablet of your heart. And a tablet is a stone tablet. It's talking about being, being chiseled. It's, this is talking about something that's being chiseled in stone. He doesn't want us to forget these things. They're chiseled in stone, right? Um, he wants these things to stay in our hearts in a very big way and then he attaches the promise to a promise to the end uh, he says and so again we say all these things have a reward he says so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man and you can you can have favor with man and, and that's a good thing to have you don't want to go through life having everybody in the world hates you because you're not a dependable person that you you don't live by good principles but to have a good reputation among men that's an important thing a pastor and a deacon the bible requires us to have a good reputation among those who are without people have to know us and know that we're people who live uh, with good character and we're not dishonest and, and 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 we're not crooked and they have to know that about us and uh here he says you can have a good good uh, you can have favor you can, you can have favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Now, of course, it's more important to have favor and high esteem with God. You know, that's what we want, right, when we stand before God. And not every man's going to like you, okay? That's just, that's just not going to happen. You're not going to please everybody. But to have favor and high esteem with God, that's, that's the greatest goal is to one day stand before Him and Him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, right? Nothing's more important than God's favor and God's high esteem, right? Nothing more important than that. But also to have favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. We can do that if we live by these high, these, these, these high wisdom principles. There's blessings. So, so there's a lot of good blessings here for remembering the wisdom our Father's trying to pass on to us. Long life, peace, God's everlasting mercy, God's everlasting faithfulness and favor in the sight of God and man. Those are some rich rewards. If you live by this wisdom, if you remember it, if you keep it, you're going to be blessed. All right, so the second thing we, we talked about last time is the help and the health of humility. Help, the help and health of humility. It's wise to be humble. It's foolish to be prideful, right? Pride is a sin. And I don't know why I went to school, you know, and they always told you, you got to take, you got to be proud. You got you to have pride. And, and no, <laughs> because the Bible says it's a sin. It's the sin of Satan. It's the sin of the devil. Uh, I, I know about doing your best at something you do and all that. And you don't want to do something because, you know, with a low quality. And I, I understand that. But we're not to be prideful. We're not to think we're better than, pe than anybody. We have to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord even to be saved. We have to confess that we're sinners who need to be saved. We have to humble ourselves. And so there's a humility here that's, that's taught in this section. You get to verse number 5. And here's what it says. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge 
him and he shall direct your paths. So we need to realize we don't, to humble ourselves, we don't have it all figured out, right? We don't have, every, we need to humble our hearts enough to confess God knows better than I do. Amen? And God know better than I do. And we have to humble our hearts enough to confess it. So we trust Him with all our hearts. We do not lean on our own understanding. It's so simple. And we know this. Why would we ever think that, that we know better than God about anything? We need to put our own feelings aside. We need to trust. We need to obey. We need to acknowledge God in every path we walk in this life, every relationship we enter into with any other people, and every choice we make, we need to make sure God is in control, that He has His hands on the wheel, that He's driving, and, and we're giving total control over to Him. And, and like, like we said, that word acknowledge, it, it means that God, he has, it's the word yada, and, it, and it's the, it means that God is intimately involved very close in every decision. Why would we do something like this? You know, uh, I can remember one time when I'm not going to say their names, but some of our kids, you know, they, they came to town, you know, and they lived far away, but they came into town and they went to a car dealership and they bought a car and then they left town and they didn't even call us. They didn't say anything to us. And I was like, okay, wow. Why didn't you say anything? You know, when you were in town buying a car, well, because they knew that we would probably say, well, you, know, you sure you want to do this? You know? And they didn't want to say anything negative, and so they just avoided us the whole time. You know? I'm not, I'm not going to tell you, Daniel, I mean, their name or anything. <laughs> it wasn't Daniel, really. But, <laughs> but I'm just saying. <laughs> I was just, wow, you know, uh, why would you avoid me just because, you, know, you know, I mean, you're grown. I'm going to let you do what you want to do, but just because I might say, hey, you know, you don't want to spend that much money, are you sure, you know? Um, but, you know, uh, why is it that, that, that we would kind of put the Lord out of any of our decisions? We kind of avoid praying about things. We avoid uh, bringing God into the situation. We need to involve God in every decision we make. We need to acknowledge Him. You know, we're not doing this ourselves. And in all our decisions, we need to lean on Him, lean on His understanding, and put our own feelings aside and say, God, what do you want me to do? I need you to lead me. And, and, but, he said, and, but here's the thing. When you do acknowledge Him, when you stop making these decisions by your ignorant self, and you say, God, I'm trusting you because you know more than I know, about this when you stop doing it all yourself and avoiding his leadership and saying lord i want to give you the lead and when you when you say lord i put this in your hands i acknowledge you that you are my god you are my leader there's a reward to that it says there in verse six he shall direct your path now do you think god's going to lead you into a bad place you think he's going to lead you he might lead you through the valley of the shadow of death but he's there with you right and he's going to take care of you but, you know, he will lead you beside the still waters. I know that. But, you know, he's, he shall direct your paths. And when God is directing your paths, that's the safest and that's the best and that's the most joyful place you can be is where God wants you to be. Now Solomon goes on to say in verse 7, and it's really the same principle. He says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It's the same idea. You trust God more than you trust yourself and again this kind of wisdom is always rewarded it says here in verse 8 it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones and you know that sounds like, almost like you'd be physically better off for it and you will you will when you live by godly wisdom you know you can you can live foolishly and you can hurt yourself physically and you, you can live by godly wisdom and actually be stronger physically and healthier physically when you make godly wise choices. You'll never go wrong, though, when you put aside your own understanding, your own lusts, your own wishes, your own selfish desires, and you just trust God and you obey Him in whatever He's, lead, he's leading you to do. The third thing we looked at, the third godly wise principle we've seen here is the prosperity of priority over possessions. Sometimes we act like our possessions are the most important things that we have. Our possessions. We act like we love them more than anything else. But we need to make sure that God is a higher priority than our possessions. He's the most important thing, the most important person, the most important individual, the most important relationship that we have. 
And here's what the, the, here's what the king tells us here. He says, honor the Lord with your possessions. And when the word of God here says honor, this means to make the Lord the most important priority. It, it says, Lord, you're most important. Because you know what? You're saying, well, this is really more important to the Lord. You're not honoring him, right? When you say this is more important than doing what God wants me to do. I want this, and so what I want is more important than what God wants. That's not honoring God, is it? Is it? When you're saying, no, I want to do my own thing, that's not honoring God. And you have to confess that. I am not honoring God by making my own choice. And so he says, he says honor him. That's saying make God the highest priority in your life. He's more important than your friends. He's more important than your spouse. He's more important than your children, all your family. He's, and the Bible says, you know, if you love any of them more than him, you're not worthy of him. He's the most important relationship you have. And so he's telling us, honor the Lord with your possessions. And so as we get back to this, you know, we, 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 we were there for a few minutes last time. So as we get back to this, did anybody remember the homework? Anybody here? Okay. Brother Nate's a teacher. What was the homework? What are some of the possessions we have and how can we... Did any, nobody else remember the homework? Oh, class, I am so disappointed in all. <laughs> huh? So, so what are our possessions that we have, some of the possessions we have, and how can we honor God with those possessions? We didn't get specific into that, but how can we honor God with some of our possessions? Did anybody think about anything like that? Or can you think of anything like that right now? Can you save your grade right now? <laughs> your Bible's a, a possession? Right? We own a Bible. How can we honor God with our Bibles? Read it. Read it study it. Amen. What else? Yeah, you did good? Make it look nice on the shelf. Make it look nice on the shelf. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it looking brand new. Yes, ma'am. Your home is a possession, and so you open it up for the Lord's work. Very good. And so uh, uh, there were people in the New Testament that actually opened up their homes and allowed people in there. You know, when Mary, Martha, and Lazarus opened up their home, to Jesus and the disciples. A plus, gold star, Miss, Miss Woogie Baker. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun on Sunday night when we were over there. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> so, okay. So you can open up your home to, to, to the church to, for, 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 for God's people. Things like What else? Amen. We and Nate were talking about that. Pick somebody up and bring them to church, you know, and and uh, unload them. Look like a bunch of little clou clowns getting out of the tiny little thing at the circus, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that'd be cool. So that that's a way to honor God with some of your possessions, you know. How about just you know saying when God blesses you with a possession, when He blesses you with a home, just get the family, gather around the family, and say, God, we thank you for giving us this home. When we thank Him, do we honor Him? And, and we say, Lord, we want to use this home for your glory. We want to live in a way that, that makes you happy. We want to live in a way that honors you. We want to live in such a way. You do that with your family. Yes, Brother Johnny? And that's, that's very interesting because, you know, the Bible talks about the units of money and calls them talents. Right, the things that God's given you, and it's it's funny. I, you know, do you think that maybe that was kind of in God's plan to make us think about there's abilities that God has given us, you know, that we can uh, that we can use for Him. And I know it's money units, but I mean, can we use our and and what's First Corinthians chapter 12 tells us that that the Spirit uh, gives to each one as to edify the church. You know, He gives us those gifts for the good of the body. Right. And so we should use those gifts, right? So some of you, uh, you know, God has blessed you where you can teach, and some of you, God has blessed you where you can, you can uh, show friendliness and hospitable. You can be hospitable, hospitality, <laughs> hospitality to people. And we'll cut that out of the video before it goes on the internet. Uh, you, you know, there's there's some of you, you know, that uh, you you can uh, you have the ability to understand things. You can help people understand things. There's some of you, you have great compassion, like when somebody lost a loved one and you've been through that experience, you can come along next to them, you know. And so there's, there's things, God has given you abilities and we ought to use them for Him, right? 
So yeah, so th so that's good. Good job. Okay, gold stars for everybody tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so we. Yeah, all three of you did answer. Yeah. <laughs> so Stacy, Stacy said, "Shut up to the associate pastor." I, uh, so that's questionable. Yeah, that's questionable behavior. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Yeah, she's gonna. I, I'm getting a vision. I'm getting a vision. I'm seeing Chase's laundry going out the window. <laughs> yeah. All right. Wrapped up in a rug. <laughs> anyway. So, all right. So we honor the Lord with our possessions, and you know what? That's the thing about our possessions. Whatever we have, God has given us. Right. Everything we have has come from Him. Right. And so they really, they belong to him in the first place, and we wouldn't have them without him. And so we ought to honor him with, with our possessions. But then there's another thing we talked about last time, because this goes on. It, it, says, it doesn't just say honor the Lord with your possessions, but it says honor him with the first fruits of all your increase. That's, that's part of this third principle as well. And, and, and your first fruits of all your increase. Your increase, that's, you know, in, a, in an agrarian society where people are farmers, that, that would be the crops that are growing in your field. But, you know, you know, you parallel that to the life that we live, your increase would be the money that you bring home. And so if you work a job, you get a paycheck from your job. If, 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 you, uh, if, you, if you, you know, have a, an inheritance from your family, whatever it is, you know, whatever it is that's your source of income, the first fruits is the first part of it and the best part of it. Of your income. So the question is, are you honoring God with the first fruits of your income? And, and really it says of all your income. And so are you honoring God? In other words, are you giving God the first and the best of your income? Listen, God deserves the first and the best. He deserves, he doesn't deserve the leftovers. He deserves the, the, to be the first one we think about. When we're planning out our budget, when we're thinking about how we're going to pay our bills, God deserves to be first, number one priority on the list. And so, you know, if you say, I'm going to do this for me, I'm going to do this for me, I'm going to do this for me, I'm going to do this for myself because I want this and I want this. And so if there's anything left over, I'm going to give a little gift to God. It's not really honoring God with your first fruits. That's not what we're called to here. We're called to something much greater. We're, this is the grace of giving we're talking about. And we're not under the law. Uh, to to give, we're under grace. But Paul says, and we read that scripture there in Corinthians last time where he talked about, I want you to abound in this grace. Not just to learn this grace, but I want you to abound in this grace. And so learn how to do this. And if, if you're not doing this, if you're, if you're not giving him the first and the best, the most important and the best, then you're not honoring God in that. And so... Uh, we should. We need to purpose in our heart to do this every time we come together, and make that the number one before you make your house payment, before you pay your car payment, before you pay your taxes, before your utilities, before you go buy your groceries, before you spend every last dime you have on gasoline. You need to make sure you give your best, most generous gift to the Lord. Make sure you do that first before anything else. And when God and His work uh, are honored or the high, when they, they become your first, when they become the highest priority in your finances, you will be honoring God with your finances. Now, just like the other two principles of wisdom that we've been talking about, there is a reward for this. There is a reward for this. And, and, and we see it here in verse 10. He says, If you honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, What's going to happen? In verse 10, he says, So your barns will be filled with plenty. Right? And the barn would be the source of the food that you're going to eat. Right? So your barns will be filled with plenty. And he says, Also, your vats will overflow with new wine. And all the alcoholics in the room said, Amen. Right? Yeah? We, we want some new wine. Vats overflowing with new wine. Yeah? Uh, so, so you put God first in your finances. And I can testify this is true. And I, you know how very seldom I ever preach about money and tithing and giving and all that. But, but when we come across in the Bible, I'm definitely going to preach about it. 
And it's, and, but I can testify, I have witnessed this, I have experienced this all my life long. When you put God first, when you honor Him with your possessions, when you honor Him with the first fruits of all your increase, you will never have to worry about doing without anything that you need ever in your life. God will take care of it. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. He will take care of your needs. And because you know how God meets our needs? My God will provide all your needs according to His riches in glory. And He's richer than anybody I know, right? He's got more, uh, than any, any, more resources than anybody. And so we need to be honoring God. We need to be very generous in our giving to God. The fourth uh, principle, the fourth wise godly principle we come across is the delight of divine discipline. The delight of divine discipline. That's in verse 11 of this proverb. And Solomon says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. That word chastening and the word correction, they're both, they're both words that speak about God punishing us. They both speak about God punishing us. Sometimes when we're not acting the way we ought to, when we're not living the way we ought to, when we're in rebellion against God, when we're sinning against God, sometimes uh, the Lord needs to punish us. Sometimes He needs to reach down with His powerful yet loving hand and correct us with discipline uh, in order to correct us and put us back on the right path and get our heart right. The Lord's punishment may not be pleasant. It seldom is pleasant. Uh, and, and it may seem like a very difficult experience to go through, but when God does it, it's always for our good when God has to punish us. And so, um, Numbers chapter 20. You think about great men of the Bible. Well, Moses is the man in Numbers chapter 20. And you know, uh, there was a time when the children of Israel were thirsty and they're, they're complaining. They said, oh, you brought us out here to die in the wilderness. And there's no water. And so the Lord took told Moses to go out there with his staff and he told him to smite the rock. And so Moses went out there with his staff and he smote the rock. You know what happened? Water began to gush out of that rock. It created a river out there in the wilderness and the millions of Israelites that were out there in the wilderness drank from that water throughout their journey that God provided them water out of a rock. And there's a picture in that that when uh, Jesus Christ was crucified for us he was smitten by the rod of men. He was smitten by a rod that was in man's hand. He was, he was crucified for our sins. And out of him has flowed living water that gives us everlasting life. Okay, that's the picture. Okay, but there came another time when Moses is out in the wilderness. And once again, the children of Israel are thirsty. And so they're complaining and they're murmuring to Moses. And so the Lord tells Moses, I want you to go and speak to the rock. He doesn't say smite it. He says, go speak to it. And Moses goes out there and he's angry with the people because they're murmuring. I can understand why he's so angry because they're just griping and moaning all the time. And Moses is angry with them. And so he, he, he takes his staff and he says, must we bring you water out of this rock? And so Moses there, he's kind of taking credit for what God did in that miraculous thing. And then Moses, in a, in a moment of anger, he takes his, his staff and he smites the rock. And nothing happens. So he smites it again. And the Lord in his mercy, he caused the water to gush out of the rock again so the people of Israel could drink. But then the Lord punished Moses. The Lord said, Moses, you disobeyed me. And so you can't lead the Israelites into the promised land. So Moses is punished by the Lord because he disobeyed his voice. Why didn't he want Moses to smite the rock again? Well, Christ only had to be smitten once. That's the, that's the picture. He doesn't have to be smitten again. He doesn't have to go to the cross again and die. His death on the cross is enough to pay for the sins of us all. Okay? And so that, that rock never has to be smitten again. and the, the, the living water can flow. But this is, Moses had to be punished. He couldn't go in. He had to be chastened by the Lord. He had to be corrected by the Lord to humble his heart and make his heart right before God. And you also, you know, you have the story of King David, you know, when he, you know, about him committing adultery with Bathsheba. And, you know, we have the story of, of him 
uh, killing Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. And, uh, of course, uh, it wasn't that God hated David. It wasn't that God was casting David out of his kingdom. It wasn't that uh, God took away David's salvation. Uh, but David had to admit definitely the joy of his salvation wasn't there. He said, and he prays in Psalm 51. He says, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. But he didn't say restore to me your salvation because he still had it. He just knew he'd lost his joy because he was living in terrible sin. But the Lord punished David. And his baby, him and little, um, that little baby that uh, him and Bathsheba brought into the world, it died. It got very sick and it died and broke David's heart. And uh, then, of course, David... The Lord told him for the rest of his life the sword would never depart from his house after that. And it didn't. Because the Lord had to chasten David to humble his heart and get his heart right with God. And sometimes the Lord has to do us, but do that for us. He has to punish us. He has to chasten us. He has to correct us so that our hearts can be made right before him. But Solomon says here, don't despise that. And, and, and though it may not be easy to endure when you're being punished by the Lord, don't detest that. Don't hate it when God's doing that for you because the Lord is always doing that for our good. And just like the, those first three godly principles that we've already looked at, excuse me, yeah, those first three, there's always a reward if we live by those godly principles of wisdom. So if you receive the Lord's chastening, without detesting it, without despising it, if you receive his chastening with a, you know, a, 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 a level of appreciation, just like as if a person said, you know, I'm glad my dad was tough on me, you know, because he made me the, the person I am today, because he disciplined me, and I learned not to do wrong things, I learned there's a consequence for wrong things, and uh, he took me out behind the woodshed for some bloodshed quite often. And so I learned how to behave. I learned how to be a man. And, it, and it, it made me a lot more ready for life. And so I'm thankful that my dad disciplined me. And if we can receive the Lord's discipline like uh, we're supposed to, if we can have the right kind of appreciation for the Lord's discipline, we're going to see the reward for that. Verse 12 says, For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, a son, in whom he delights. And so your reward is that God will be a heavenly father who delights in you and who uh, always does what's right for you, even if it's painful, even if it's, it's hard. That's a precious thing to have, is a God who loves you enough to discipline you. In fact, the, the writer of Hebrews quotes these words from this proverb. He quotes what we've just read here about not uh, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor detest his correction for whom the Lord loves he corrects just as a father son in whom he delights in Hebrews 12 the writer of Hebrews quotes that but he goes on and, and a few verses later he tells us there's no chastening that seems to be joyful for the present you know no kid in the middle of getting his but spanked okay no kid in the middle of that ever said gosh dad this is great man i'm loving this you know that that's just it, it's never joyful for the present but painful nevertheless afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it it produces the right kind of attitude and the right kind of living towards our heavenly father who loves us i can remember when well, Ashley was about two or three years old, and I was on staff at Bedford Baptist Temple. It's now Meadow Creek Church, but I was, I was on staff there, and I was leading music, so I had to sit up on the front row. The staff all had to sit on the front row and be ready to jump up and do whatever was you were called on to do. And so I led music that day, and I'm sitting up on the front row. My wife's sitting here. My little daughter Ashley is sitting there between us. I think little Brett was a little baby around that time, and I can remember that my little daughter starts getting feisty during the during the church service and she starts just kind of wiggling around starting to make noise and her mom's telling her you be quiet and i lean over to her and i say you be quiet she starts to get fussy she starts to get loud she starts to get angry she starts to cry and so i just take her by the hand and i get up and i start to walk out and i, I you know i'm on the front row and so i come around and i just start going down the middle aisle and i'm holding on to her and she's go oh daddy no daddy please please don't spank me she's yelling it all the way down the aisle and everybody in the whole church is just laughing all the way back you know she's going please don't spank me but i did and uh, and uh, uh when i came back out after i came back in we sat down and 
And uh, she was real, just a little angel all the time after that, right? It never seems to be pleasant for the, for the present. But afterwards, it produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. I hated whipping my kids. I absolutely hated whipping my kids. But every once in a while, they needed it. Um, and and this, this really teaches us something here. Wisdom is sometimes hard to acquire. Sometimes you have to go through di- difficulty to get wisdom. Sometimes you have to endure through chastening. Sometimes you have to go through difficult things. But those things make you wise. But, but this teaches us that it's worth going through those difficult things. Wisdom is worth something. That's why the scripture goes on here to talk about how precious wisdom is. We see in verse 13... He says, happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding for her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than better than fine gold. She's more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare to her. You know, and, that, and the reason that's true is because there's so many people that win the lottery or inherit a lot of money and then a, a year from that they're broke and they don't have it and they're miserable. You know, and so many of them that, that win all this money, they commit suicide because they're miserable. It didn't make them happy. They find out there's no peace in it. But, you know, imagine coming into that kind of money but having the wisdom of God about how to deal with that kind of money. And, and that's why wisdom is more valuable than all kinds of wealth because it teaches you about things. And so he's really telling us whatever difficulties we have to endure through to get wisdom, we ought to be willing to go through it because it's totally worth it. And verse 16 says, length of days is in her right hand. It's talking about wisdom. In her right hand is length of days. In her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. And listen to this. I love this. It says, she's a tree of life to those who take hold of her and happy are all who retain her. You'll be happy if you hold on to wisdom. Did you know there was a, and, and I really like that where it talks about the tree of life. Do you know there was a tree of life in the Garden of Eden? When you read the book of Genesis, and after Adam and Eve sinned, and they got cast out of the garden, the Lord placed an angel with a flaming sword there at the entrance of the garden so that men wouldn't go in and eat of the tree of life and live forever. Revelation, though, in chapter 22, we're reading Revelation 22, it tells us that when Christ returns in his kingdom, all of us who live in that kingdom, we're going to be able to eat freely of the tree of life. And that tree has 12 manner of fruits that it bears in each, all 12 seasons of the year. Can you imagine that? It's going to be springtime all, the, all through the year, and the tree's going to bear 12 different kinds of fruits. And so it may be a peach tree. I don't know what kind of fruits it's going to have on it, but it, you, you're going to be able to eat freely from the tree of life. And its leaves are for the healing of the nation. Isn't that amazing? But the only way we can ever have access to the tree of life is if we come through the tree Jesus died on. That's the only way to come into heaven to be in the kingdom is to, to come through the tree that Jesus died on, the tree of death he died on to pay the price for our sins. And Solomon says here, wisdom is a tree of life to all who take hold of her. And listen to what he says in verse 19. He says, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth by understanding. He established the heavens by his knowledge. The depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew. And, and so Solomon's showing us here, if you want to know wisdom, Look to the Lord and, and consider all his mighty works that we can see all around us every day in, in, in the world around us. As he, as he tells us in Romans chapter 1, he says, Since the creation of the world, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. You go outside, you look up at the sky, you see the sun, you see the moon, you see the stars, you see the clouds, you see the rain. Oh man, last couple of weeks, it not have been great? You see the rain coming down again, and you go, thank you, Lord. We, we serve a mighty, great God who's, who's able to do anything. And when you see that, that is the beginning of, of, of getting you closer to being wise. And so, um, <clears throat> the fifth thing we see here, I'm going to move on because I'm running out of time. The fifth thing, the security of staying sound. Look at verse uh, number 21. He says, My son, let them not depart from your eyes. These godly, wise principles. Let them not depart from your eyes. 
Keep sound wisdom and discretion. And so the fifth principle Solomon gives us is that we should hold on to it. Keep it. Uh, Once you get these principles in your heart and your mind, keep them there. You say, well, that sounds a lot like remembering. Uh, But he says here, let them not depart from your eyes. And how do we do that? How do we not let sound wisdom depart from before our eyes? We keep our eyes on this book, right? We keep our eyes looking down on this book and reading this book. And that's why we have, that's why we gather in church and and we read God's Word and we study God's Word together because we need to be reminded of it. We need to be refreshed in it. We need to learn it. We need to love it. We need to keep it. We need to keep the Word of God before our guys, uh, before our eyes. And, And again, if you live by this principle, you'll be rewarded. Hold on to these things. And Solomon says here in verse 22, So they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then you will walk safely in your way. Your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you'll not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. Isn't that awesome? Right? You'll lie down and your sleep will be sweet. That's awesome, isn't it? I love to go to bed and just sleep and not think about anything till the next morning, right? The only thing I'm thinking about is what's for breakfast, right? And that's super... So he says, he says, do not be afraid of the sudden terror. We're not laying in bed worrying and biting our nails and pacing back and forth in the hallway drinking Maalocks and all that kind of stuff. We're, we're happy. We're at peace. Don't be afraid of the terror nor the trouble from the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. So you hang on to these things. You'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. Sixthly, the sixth wise godly principle, the loftiness of the law of love. Boy, you had to know that love was coming in here somewhere, right? When you, when you talk about wisdom. And he says in verse 27, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power, when it is the power of your hand to do so. You're able to help them. You should, you, should, you should do good to them. He says, Do not say to your neighbor, Go and come back, and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. He says, Don't treat people that way. So we're talking about how you treat your neighbor. So if you hire somebody to do a job and, and he does that job for you, don't hold his salary while he struggles to pay his bills. You go ahead and you give it to him. And if somebody needs your help and, and, and you're in a position where you can help him, don't wait till tomorrow. You go ahead and you help him now because he needs that help right now. And Solomon goes on here in verse 29. He says, do not devise evil against your neighbor so not only do we we help people we we give to them when it's in our hand to give to them uh we do good for them when it's in our power to do so uh, as soon as we're able but also on the other side don't go looking for trouble with people don't go starting trouble with people stay out of other people's business and other people's disputes and don't go stirring up trouble without a cause right i know there's cause sometimes to to get in conflicts and things, but when you don't have to, don't do As Romans chapter 12 tells us, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. That's what I want to do, right? I can remember I was standing here one time, one time and I was writing names on the, on the notepad, just writing them down. Everybody come in and write down their name. They come in and write down their name. Every time Caleb came walking in, he says, what are you writing there? I said, I'm writing down the name of people that I can beat up. He says, I don't think you can beat me up. I said, well, that's no problem, bud. I can just scratch your name right off the list. You know, no problem. I don't want to start nothing with somebody big like Caleb, you know. But again, there's a reward if, for living these wise, godly principles. If, if, if you treat your neighbor with love the way that your neighbor ought to be treated. And, and he says here in verse 29, he says, For he dwells by you. For safety's sake. Your neighbor dwells by you for safety's sake. God puts you and your neighbor next to each other for a reason. And if, and if you're good to him, you treat him right, you know, there may come a day when you need his help too. You know, you don't know what life's going to bring you. And because you treated him well, he may treat you well. And Solomon goes on here. He says, do not strive with a man without cause uh, if he has done you no harm. So love your neighbor Treat them like you'd want to be treated, and that'll that'll be a blessing that comes back to you. And then seventh and finally, the seventh principle here, we see the the content character of the committed. We're committed to serving the Lord. We should be content in that. Don't envy, is what he says in verse 31. Do not envy the oppressor. 
and choose none of his ways. Right? And there are a lot of people in this world who are very wealthy. They have a lot of money. And I know they got to where they are. They, 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 they got that money by doing bad things to people. They deceive people. They scam people. There are scammers out there who hurt people. And some people become wealthy on the backs of the people they take advantage of. I know that. Solomon says, don't envy them. And he says, don't ever choose any of their ways. Don't, don't, you know, do you know why you don't envy them? They may look rich. They may seem happy, but that's not going to last forever. One of these days, we're all going to stand before God to be judged. Every one of us. And if you're living by the wisdom of God's word, you know, and the, and the greatest wisdom of all is know Jesus Christ as your Savior, right? There's no, nothing wiser than that. But if you're living, if you know Christ as your Savior and you're living by the wisdom of God's Word, you can sleep well at night. You can, you can sleep in peace. But how do you think the oppressor sleeps? The person who takes advantage of other people. You know, if we lose all our earthly goods, we still have the Lord, Right? If we lose everything, we still have the Lord, and, and we're going to live with Him in eternity forever and ever. If we lose everything, we still have the Lord. But when the oppressor loses all his earthly goods, he doesn't have the Lord. What does he have left? Right? So don't envy him. Right? There's coming a day when he'll have to answer for his deeds, and so don't envy him. Be content that you know the Lord and that you're going to dwell with Him in His house forever. Right? I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So as we come down to the end of Proverbs, Solomon's going to make four contrasts here. Real quickly, I'm going to go through them. Verse 32, he says, The perverse person is an abomination to the Lord. Perverse. The pervert, right, is an abomination to the Lord. But his secret counsel is with the upright. In other words, the, the Lord says of the perverse person, he's, he's a, an abomination, he's, he's disgusting, he's a terrible sin, but... The Lord's secret counsel is with the upright. The wicked uh, are going to pay a consequence for their, for their very wicked deeds, but those who are wise enough to live uprightly in the sight of the Lord, they're going to have such a relationship with the Lord that it's like the Lord is leaning down to them, whispering important secrets in their ear. Can you imagine that, right? That's, that's, that's a special thing. The, the, the secret counsel of the Lord is with the upright. And he, a, a second contrast, the curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. What would you rather have? Very simple, very clear. I'd rather be blessed by God than cursed by God, right? Isn't that simple? Right? Um, 34, verse 34, we have the third contrast. Surely he, that's the Lord, the Lord surely he scorns the scornful. Wait a minute, I thought it wasn't nice to make fun of people. Well, he's, he makes fun of people that make fun of people. He scorns the scornful. And it says, Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. Those people who think they're better than everybody and they're always looking down at other people and always cutting down other people, the Lord scorns them. Did you know God scorns the scornful? It says in Psalm 2, he, he's talking about as God looks at the, the wicked of this earth who are trying to throw God's authority off, it says, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. God laughs when he sees how goofy they're being, how foolish they're being. But he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. I would rather have God's grace than his scorn. Amen? Okay. Um, and then the final contrast, verse 35, the wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. So would you rather have glory or shame, right? Glory, I want the glory. I just want a little taste of the glory, right? Just got to get, get a little taste of the glory. I don't want the shame, right? All right. So there's some rich, rich rewards for living by these principles of wisdom. There's some terrible, terrible consequences when you forget this wisdom, when you let it go, when you live... Uh, foolishly. There's some terrible consequences. So uh, we, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight.